Heavenly Father, as we come now to your word, we pray that we would be growing in our knowledge of you and that you would be strengthening our conscience how to live out the gospel. But help us, Lord, to know these things rightly, not to be puffed up in pride, but to deepen in our love for you and for one another. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, is it okay for Christians to practice, uh, to participate in the practices of other religions? Is it okay for Christians to participate in the practices of other religions? religions. Some years ago, I went to a, a funeral, uh, and it was a Buddhist funeral, so uh, the wake and the funeral had all the normal Taoist practices, you know, including bowing down to the ancestors and all of that. And to show our love and respect, my wife and I attended the funeral. And is often the, as is often the case, there was the pressure for us to participate in the service. Now, we took our stand, and we didn't participate, we chose to show our love and respect in other ways, apart from bowing down to people. But it was an important moment for us to show that, that we were Christians, we believed in Jesus. Now, I think many of us who have converted out of non-Christian families are faced with similar kinds of decisions. You know, is it okay to visit the Hindu temple or to participate in Qingming? Or is it okay to go to the Catholic mass uh, or eat food that has been offered at the family altar at home. Is it okay for Christians to participate in the practices of other religions? Well, we come now to 1 Corinthians chapter 8, and we will uh, deal with these questions today. Uh, we saw that the Corinthians have written a letter to Paul asking him a number, uh, questions about a number of issues that are dividing the church. Uh, and we've seen that in chapters 7 to 14, he's actually answering those questions. He introduces each answer with that phrase, now concerning. So chapter 7, verse 1, now concerning the matters about which you wrote. And verse 25, now concerning the betrothed. Chapter 8, verse 1 here, now concerning food offered to idols. And then in chapter 12, verse 1, we'll see now concerning spiritual Gifts. So, so far, we've dealt with questions of sex and marriage, remarriage, singleness, divorce, all of these things. But now in chapter, chapter 8, uh, we begin a new section that takes us all the way to chapter 14, where we first think about false worship, uh, chapters 8 to 10, specifically the idea of food sacrifice to idols, and then true worship, chapters 11 to 14. And uh, we'll think specifically about the roles of men and women in church, uh, and the exercise of spiritual gifts. Now, and as we'll see, Paul addresses these various issues with great care because he knows he's writing to a divided church that has different opinions on these matters. Uh, we've seen in chapters 1 to 4 that he not only wants to address the issues that they've raised, but he wants to do, it, do so in a way that brings the church together, back to unity. It, he does this by what uh, Don Carson calls a yes, but argument. Right? So he'll, he'll affirm certain truths. He'll say, yes, these things are true. Uh, and he affirms these certain things that some people in the church would have believed. But then he qualifies those truths with alternative truths that, that, that others in the church may have emphasized instead. So it's yes, this is true, but this is also true. Uh, and thus, he brings a, a deeper, more integrated view of the issue that brings the church together in love, despite their differences. So as I mentioned, the issue here is food sacrifice to idols. Verse 1, now concerning food offered to idols. Now, we need to remember that uh, the Corinthian church had, of course, converted out of a pagan culture. And the question was, now that they were Christians... How should they relate to those pagan religions around them? Is it okay to eat food sacrificed to idols? Because if you lived in Corinth at that time, uh, food sacrificed to idols was a big issue that was really impossible to avoid. There were many temples in Corinth, and the food that was sacrificed at those temples would then be taken out uh, and sold at the meat markets behind the temple. Uh, and so not only that, but uh, celebrations such as weddings or uh, these kind of things would be held in the dining halls uh, attached to these various temples at which, of course, they would serve the food 
that had been sacrificed or offered to these gods at the temple. So even if you didn't go to the temple yourself, even if you never attended any of these wedding celebrations and so on, well, you might have a pagan neighbor or friend and they might invite you over to their house for dinner. And guess what? Yes, you got it right. The food that they might cook for you and serve for you was most likely offered to a pagan god because they bought it from the market next to the temple. And so this became a very contentious issue. Could you eat food that had been sacrificed to an idol, to a false god? And some in the church thought, yes, because after all, pagan gods aren't real gods anyway, so it wasn't really idolatry. And others in the church thought, no, this, this is idolatrous. This, we can't possibly eat this food that has been offered to another god. And so the church is divided. So what's the solution here? Should you eat the food sacrificed to the idol or not? And uh, Paul gives his answer in three parts uh, in a sandwich structure in chapters 8 to 10. We've seen chapter 8, food sacrificed to idols. Chapter 9, he talks about surrendering our rights. And then chapter 10, he circles back to food sacrifice to idols. Uh, and uh, so what we need to remember is that today's sermon, chapter 8, is just part one of three in answering this question. Uh, we'll need to listen on in the following weeks. But if we were to summarize his entire answer across the three chapters, uh, one commentator puts it this way. Do everything out of love for God and people. Restrict the exercise of your rights for the sake of the gospel. Do everything out of love for God and people. Restrict your right, exercise of your rights for the sake of of the gospel. Okay, with, with that introduction, now let's uh, dive into the passage itself. And before coming to the issue itself, Paul knows there's a deeper issue that he needs to address first. And that is point one. We need love and not just knowledge. We need love and not just knowledge. Because a deeper problem among the Corinthian church is their intellectual arrogance. Some have the right answer to this question intellectually, theologically, but they lack love in how they're using that knowledge to relate to the other Christians. So verse 1, now concerning food offered to idols, we know that all of us possess knowledge. Paul seems to quote here from their letter they've written to him. See, their justification for eating food sacrificed to idols is the knowledge that they possess. And we'll see in verses 4 to 6 what knowledge they're talking about, and, and that is that an idol is just an idol. It's not a real God. There's only one true God, uh, and, and therefore it doesn't matter if you eat the food. Now, knowledge like that is clearly a good thing. It's important to know who God is and what he's like. It's important to know the truth of the gospel. It's important to know how the gospel applies in different parts of life, including this area of food offered to idols. Knowledge is good. We should be growing in knowledge. But simply knowing something intellectually is not enough. Our knowledge must always be accompanied by love. We need love and not just knowledge. And that is because mere knowledge by itself, without love with it, can simply make us proud. So verse 1, he says, this knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. See, knowledge without love can lead us to be overly inflated, you know, bulging like a balloon that's got way too much air inside it. We, we think that with our knowledge, we are superior to other Christians that don't have as much knowledge as us. And, and that can happen with any knowledge, not just knowledge of, of, of the Bible. Uh, now, it's good to study the Bible deeply. I hope we can agree on that. But we never study the Bible just for knowledge's sake. Uh, so that I can proudly think I'm a better Christian than those other people because I know this theology, I know this catechism, I can quote verse here and there. Knowledge is good. It's good to know all those things, creeds and catechisms and all that. But it's meant to be used in love to build up others, not to inflate our own egos to make us think that we're better than other Christians. It's meant to be used to strengthen us and others in the faith to encourage them in following Jesus, not to put them down. 
But more than that, when knowledge is not accompanied by love, it can actually be used to harm other people. So, for example, uh, imagine that someone uh, confides a secret to you. Uh, or you know some special knowledge because you are sitting on a particular committee, say a leadership committee. Now that knowledge that you have can be used for good, can't it? But it can also be used for harm, say for example if you gossiped or you use that knowledge to threaten someone, you know, if you don't do this I'm going to let, uh, going to let your secret out. So the knowledge is good, but knowledge can be used for good or knowledge can be used for harm. And therefore, real knowledge is not just about knowing facts, but it's about knowing how to use those facts for the good of other people. And if we haven't yet worked out how to use our knowledge in a loving way, then we haven't properly, properly known it yet. And that's what he says in verse 2. If anyone imagines that he knows something, he does not yet know as he ought to know. Uh, he's saying there's always more to know. To think you already know all that there is to know is supremely arrogant. Uh, if we know correctly, then we will know that there is more to know, and we don't know it yet. But even more than that, our, our pride in our theological insights can actually make us blind to our own faults. We have no love. We have to know rightly how to use our knowledge to love other people. So uh, one commentator, Brian Rosner, he writes this, True theological understanding, and certainly true knowledge of God, does not lead one to act in a way which is insensitive to others and offensive to God. Another writer says this, Only when a person has love can he, can he be said to know as he ought to know. So what he's saying is that true knowledge can't be separated from love. Our knowledge will all, and therefore our knowledge will always be incomplete because our love will always be imperfect, you see. God is the one who knows fully and loves perfectly, uh, but we don't, right? We don't love perfectly and we don't know fully, so we will always be incomplete. And the way that we are to be in relationship with God is is not simply by knowledge, but love. And that's what he says in verse 3. But if anyone loves God, he is known by God. Now, loving God here, it's not just about uh, you know, having warm, fuzzy feelings inside here. Uh, it's about giving God our, our wholehearted uh, devotion. Uh, in this passage, we'll see time and again, he has in mind uh, Deuteronomy 6. Hear, O Israel... The Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your might. But it's not quite what we're expecting as we read that verse. Where, you know, we think if anyone loves God, he knows God rightly. Maybe that's what we're, what we're expecting to read here. But Paul turns it around. If anyone loves God, he is known by God. Uh, he, he, he uses this to humble the, Christian, humble the proud Christians like those in Corinth that are puffed up by their knowledge. Because he's saying what ultimately matters, therefore, is not our knowledge of God, but his knowledge of us. Knowing just not just intellectually, but in relationship with us. So knowing is actually meant to be a relational Category. To be known by God means to be brought into relationship with God. Of course, God knows everything, so in that sense, he knows all of us. But to be known by God here means to have been brought into relationship with him. No longer his enemies, but reconciled in right relationship. And so knowing and loving, again, can never be separated. Knowing is relational, and therefore we need love and not just knowledge by itself. So let's just turn to think of ourselves then. Are you a proud Christian? Do you think that you, you're better than others because you're more mature? You're more in the know. You know, you know more about this Bible maybe than other churches around here 
in Penang. If we've really understood the gospel and really understood God's word, we'll be humble, we'll acknowledge we don't know all there is to know, we'll use our knowledge in love to help others, not to puff ourselves up in pride. We need love, not just knowledge. So that brings us to the second point. We know that idols have no real existence. We know that idols have no real existence. So verse 4, Therefore, as to the eating of food offered to idols, we know that an idol has no real existence and that there is no God but one. Again, these, uh, these quotations seem to be from their letter to justify their eating of food sacrifice to idols. They're saying, look, idols have no real existence. You know, they're just things that human beings have made up. So it's irrelevant whether the food was offered to the idol or not. Now, Paul certainly agrees with them here that there's one true God. Idols aren't real gods. They're just pieces of wood or stone, uh, maybe painted with some gold paint or something like that. But they're made up by the human imagination. They don't correspond with reality. They're, they're a delusion. They're a deception. There is only one God, the Lord. We just read in Deuteronomy 6. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. There's only one God. Therefore, love the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, your mind, and your, and your might. So Paul reaffirms their statement here. There's only one God. Other, other idols, they're not real gods. They have no real existence to them. But notice how he then recasts this in wonderfully Christian terms to reassert the full divinity of the Lord Jesus. Look at verse 5. For although there may be so-called gods in heaven and on earth, as indeed there are many gods and many lords, yet for us there is one God, the Father, from whom all things are all things and for whom we exist, and one Lord, Jesus Christ, through whom are all things and through whom we exist. Now, as we saw in Deuteronomy 6, the Lord in capital letters, or Yahweh, was God's personal name. But notice here, Paul affirms that the Lord is, is Jesus. Jesus is Lord. He describes the Father as the creator of all things, the goal of all things. And he describes the Son in exactly the same terms as the Father, as the creator of all things and the agent of creation. The mediator, if you like, who fulfills and brings to completion all the Father's purposes in creation and redemption. There are many who deny the full divinity of Christ, but I hope you see how clearly it is stated in this verse. The one true God, the God of Israel, is the God who is Father, Son, and yes, also Holy Spirit as well. The Son equal to his Father, fully divine. So Paul certainly agrees with their statement, correctly expressed. You know, idols have no real existence. There's only one God, the Christian God, which, who, who is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And so in that sense, there's nothing intrinsically wrong with eating food that has been offered sacrifice to an idol. There are some things that are intrinsically wrong, like the sexual immorality that he's dealt with in the previous, uh, the previous chapters. But food sacrifice to idols is not one of those things that is, is, is intrinsically wrong. Uh, Jesus himself said in Mark 7, verse 39, if you remember, all foods are clean. We read this, Mark 7. Jesus said to them, then are you also without understanding? Do you not see that whatever goes into a person from outside cannot defile him, since it enters not into his heart but his stomach and is expelled? Thus he declared all foods Clean. And he said, what comes out of a person is what defiles him. For from within, out of the heart of man, come evil thoughts, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, coveting, wickedness, deceit, sensuality, envy, slander, pride, foolishness. All these things come from within and they defile a person. So Jesus says all foods is clean. You can go out and you can eat your char stew. You can eat whatever foods. It's all clean. Praise God. But just because it's not intrinsically wrong to eat it doesn't necessarily mean that it's okay for you to eat it. 
because, this is the third point now, not all possess this knowledge. Not all possess this knowledge. Verse 7, however, not all possess this knowledge. See, the problem is not the food. The problem is that some Christians, though they know that there is only one God, one true God, still act as though idols are real. Let me say it again. The problem is not the food. The problem is that some Christians, though they know there's only one true God, still act as though idols are real. Verse 7 says this, But some, through former association with idols, eat food as really offered to an idol, and their conscience, being weak, is defiled. So idols are not real because there are no gods but the one true God. But some Christians have, Christians have yet to have their, their consciences fully shaped by the word of God. So they still feel as though eating food sacrificed to an idol is idolatrous. And so if they eat the food and they go against their conscience, they then defile their conscience, right? They're, they're led into sin. Now, Paul calls these people having weak consciences because their conscience has not yet been properly calibrated yet according to, to gospel truth. They're, they're, they're saying something's bad when it's, when it's not really bad. But even though their conscience on this particular point is, is wrong, it's not fully trained yet, it fully, hasn't fully understood the implications of the gospel, Paul still doesn't want them going against their conscience. Because going against your conscience, well, that, that's the spirit of sin. And Paul definitely doesn't want them to sin. And so what that meant was that although some of the Corinthians had true knowledge, it was okay to eat this food offered to the idols. They were lacking in love because they were stumbling their weaker brothers who hadn't yet come to understand this knowledge in the same way that they had. And thereby they were causing them to commit idolatry in their hearts as they ate this food going against their own consciences. It's not that the gods were anything. It's not that these idols were real. It wasn't that the food had any problems with it. It was all about how they were thinking about the food. So it says in verse 8, Food will not commend us to God. We are no worse off if we do not eat, and no better off as we do. Food is just food, in other words. Ryan Rosner puts this way. He says, the problem is not with what the food does to us, but with what we might do with some food. And so the Corinthians, some of them at least, were just thinking about themselves. Not what would please God, not what would be loving to their brothers and sisters. They thought, I've got the knowledge, I'm right, who cares what it does to you? And so that brings us to the final point. We should forego our rights rather than stumble our brother. We should forego our rights rather than stumble our brother, brother or sister. We see that in verse 9. But take care that this right of yours does not somehow become a stumbling block to the weak. And Paul's point in this section is, is this. Whether or not an action is objectively allowed by God or not, we should never do anything that will stumble our Christian brother or sister. We should forego our rights rather than stumble our brother or sister. An idol might be nothing. Eating food sacrificed to an idol may not matter at all. But that doesn't mean that we can just go ahead and eat it if it's going to stumble our brother or sister who still thinks it's wrong to do that action because they've not yet fully understood biblical teaching. Now, I think our world today is quite obsessed with rights, right? the right to vote, the right to marry, the right to safety, the right to not wear a face mask or whatever it may be. We go on and on. We talk about human rights. We put a huge emphasis on protecting human rights. And, of course, it's entirely right to protect the human rights of other people. But it's another thing altogether to insist on our own rights 
to the harm of other people. Protecting the rights of others is loving. Demanding our own rights to the detriment of others is selfish. And the Christian who has understood the gospel will not be self-serving, they will be self-sacrificial. In other words, the exercise of our rights must always be qualified by the gospel priority to love other people and particularly not to stumble them in the faith. Now, Paul has in mind here the particular right to eat any food. Jesus declared all foods were clean. There's nothing wrong in principle with eating food sacrificed to idols. It only matters in the sense of how it affects other people. So he goes on, verse 10. If anyone sees you have knowledge, you who have knowledge eating in an idol's temple, will he not be encouraged, if his conscience is weak, to eat food offered to idols? So in your heart you might think eating food sacrificed to an idol is fine. But that doesn't mean that the other Christian does. They might think that it's wrong. But he might be encouraged by your behaviour. He watches, he says you eating the food as if it's nothing. And then he goes ahead and eats it. And then he commits idolatry in his heart. We might not think that's a particularly serious matter. But we need to remember what Paul said back in chapter 6, verses 9 and 10. And that is that idolaters will not inherit the kingdom of God. Chapter 6, verse 9, he said, Do you not know the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Don't be deceived. Neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers, will inherit the kingdom of God. And that's what Paul means in verse 11 when he says that the weak person is destroyed. This is verse 11, by your knowledge, this weak person is destroyed for whom Christ died. You think you're just eating some food. You're, you're just claiming your gospel rights. But actually you're stumbling another Christian to the point that you might be sending them to hell as they live a life of idolatry. It's a very serious matter, actually. And so the loving thing to do is to simply give up your rights to not eat the food that's been offered to the, to the idol. Even though it's objectively fine, you don't eat it so that you don't stumble your brother. To, to, eat, to, to, to do otherwise, to just eat anyway, is instead harming your brother or sister. It's, it's unloving, it's sinful. It's like stabbing them, it's like murdering their conscience, if you like. Verse 12 says, thus sinning against your brother and wounding their conscience when it is weak, you sin against Christ. So you eat that food, you may as well be stabbing them in the heart as you make them commit sin. He's saying here, sin against your brother is sin against Jesus too. It's, it's not just about claiming your rights. Not just about doing what you want to do. We need to do what is loving to God and what is loving to to others. Jesus Christ didn't stand on his rights, did he? Jesus didn't insist on what was best for him. He had every right to do that. I mean, he was the eternal son of God, worthy of our adoration and, and, and worship. But in love for his heavenly father and in love for us, he willingly gave up those rights. He took on human flesh and lived among us. He laid down his life on the cross and he did that even though he was right and we were wrong and if that's what Jesus did how can we then stand on our own rights just because we're right to the harm of other people we should be following Christ should we not and thinking about how we can love and serve other people even though it might be costly or it might be inconvenient to me. And so Paul comes to his conclusion, verse 13. Therefore, if food makes my brother stumble, I will never eat meat, lest I make my brother stumble. Paul says he would be willing to never eat meat again. Not because meat is bad. We don't have to become vegetarians here. But he would refrain from eating it if it was sacrificed to an idol so that he wouldn't stumble his brother or his sister. 
He would give up his right forever if he had to, if it was going to be loving to them. And he expects the Corinthians, he expects us, to think in the same way, to be willing to give up our rights, whatever they may be, for the sake of other people. Well, what does this mean for us today? Now, I think in our culture, the eating of food sacrificed to idols may well be a very live issue. Most restaurants have altars to false gods within them. Some weddings and funerals are run in temples or halls of other religions. We still may visit the houses of non-Christians who pray to their gods before setting the food before us. And so we may still be faced with the very same issues that he's just, just discussed in this chapter. And we need to understand that eating food sacrificed to idols is not intrinsically wrong. But we shouldn't go against our own conscience and we shouldn't stumble those around us. But of course, these principles could apply to a myriad of other different issues as well. Just one example the, uh, of drinking alcohol. Uh, in many churches, drunkenness is a real issue, uh, even amongst church leaders. I'm told that in Sarawak, it's one of the biggest issues among the clergy, drunkenness, let alone their, their, their church members. It's not uncommon for uh, pastors and their congregations to get drunk in their own church buildings. Can you believe it? And so because I know that drunkenness is a real struggle, sin for many Christians here in Malaysia, I've made the deliberate decision not to drink alcohol in a public setting, like a, a wedding banquet or a funeral or even in the presence of another uh, church member, even in my own home. Now, that's not because I think drinking alcohol is bad. You know, in private, if I'm at home with my wife, I'm more than happy to drink a glass of wine. I'm certainly happy to drink Holy Communion. <laughs> but because I know that many struggle with drunkenness, which is condemned by the Scriptures, and I don't want to encourage others to think that drunkenness is okay by observing me as a Christian leader, you know, drinking happily in public setting, therefore assuming that being drunk is fine. I'd rather give up drinking alcohol than stumble other Christians to sin in that particular way. Now, similar discussions are relevant to, to the idea of, of ancestor worship. Now, that's a complicated issue. There's a lot more to say about that. We'll do that when we get to chapter 10. But for now, at least what we can say is this. We should never go against our conscience no matter how much pressure is put on us by our parents or by our other relatives. And we should never, by our actions, stumble other people. For example, by bowing down to a family altar in the presence of other Christians, wounding their consciences by suggesting it's okay to worship someone other than Jesus. We can at least say that. There's a lot more to say. We'll do that in the following weeks. But the same principles here could apply to a million other different situations, including whether or not you want to wear a face mask or not, right? But the key principle is this. As Christians, we don't stand on our rights. We don't do things simply because we're right and other people are wrong. We're humble about what we know, and we use our knowledge in love to serve other people and not to stumble other people. And as we live like that, as we serve others in love, we are following the example of the Lord Jesus Christ, who gave up his rights in loving service of us. So what about you? Will you be proud and self-seeking, or will you serve others in love? Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we want to thank you for our Lord Jesus Christ who left the glories of heaven, laying aside his rights that he might die for us on the cross. We want to thank you for the freedom and the forgiveness that Christ has brought us. And we pray that you would be growing us in our knowledge of Christ helping us to know more and more how to live out the gospel in every area of life, but also help us to be growing in love 
so that our, our knowledge may be used to serve other people in love and not to exalt ourselves in pride. We pray this in Jesus' name.